Hello, my name is Rowan Yeoman. I'm from the Arkina Foundation uh, based in New Zealand. Uh, and this is uh, a short webinar um, in our support tool series. And it's focusing on types of social enterprise, how to understand and identify different types of social enterprise. Really, we're creating these tools uh, as a way to support um, people and organizations that are working with social enterprises. And so being able to create um, a bit of a taxonomy and a set of mental models for understanding social enterprises that will uh, help you better understand where they're coming from and what help they might need. Um, there's lots of different ways of thinking about how you define categories of social enterprise. Um, what we're going to talk about today is by no means definitive, but um, there are a couple of categories that we find uh, very useful in terms of understanding different social enterprises. Um, we're going to walk through uh, types of social enterprise by starting point and types of social enterprise by way of delivering impact. Uh, so hopefully this will be useful. Uh, we're going to walk through some examples um, that will hopefully explain things. Um, but to begin with, types of social enterprise by starting point is really about what's the DNA of the social enterprise? What's the, the thing it's beginning from and how it's beginning? And we're going to look at social enterprise startups, transitioning not-for-profits, community enterprises, and joint ventures. And the different flavors of these um, really kind of define um, some of the core variants around social enterprise um, and, and what they might be working on and what they might need for support. So as an example um, for transitioning not-for-profits, uh, Kilmarnock Enterprises, which is an amazing social enterprise based in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, so they were a, a sheltered um, work environment for people with intellectual disabilities. And a number of years ago had a funding crisis where their traditional um, not-for-profit funding was under threat and they had to transition themselves into a social enterprise that competed in a market um, offering um, services to large organizations um, and had to really re-gear their organization and move that and make that shift from not-for-profit to social enterprise. Um, social enterprises that are transitioning not-for-profits may be trying to convert their entire organization to um, trade-based social enterprise, or they may be um, trying to spin out a small um, piece of the, biz of the organization. They may be um, you know, looking to acquire an enterprise to add to what they're doing. It's various different ways that they might be cutting that. Um, and the other, another feature that's worth noting is that they will, they will likely have existing communities, products, or services to leverage. Um, or existing groups of customers based on the not-for-profit um, that they're currently running. And so you, you start with that context in mind, but they'll also start with a legacy of ways of operating and ways of um, constructing their organization that, that they'll have to overcome if they're going to transition to something more like a social enterprise. Social startups. Um, so the example here is Eat My Lunch, a New Zealand-based um, social enterprise startup, which is provides um, free lunches for kids in schools uh, as a one-for-one a -one model with uh, based on selling corporate lunches. Um, so social startups tend to be founder-led, so one or more founders who come together and decide to start something from scratch. They tend to have maximum flexibility in terms of their ability to change direction and write their own ticket and really follow um, you know their, their own path in terms of where they want to go they're not encumbered by um, a bunch of pre-existing um, brand or infrastructure but they also don't gain the benefit of pre-existing brand and infrastructure um, and they can be high growth focused which means they can be like a scalable startup that wants to to um, take us you know take a product or service based approach and scale it to a large number of people um, or they might not be. They may still be small, you know, and, and want to stay small. 
Uh, community enterprises, now these really have a, a very particular flavor and make up a lot of social enterprises. Um, the example here is Crave Cafe, which is based um, in Morningside in Auckland. Um, they tend to be place-based, so they often come out of um, existing community organizations or groups of people that have come together to solve a, a local problem. Um, so they tend to be community organized, locally focused. Often they're not interested in, in big scale or anything like that. They're more um, about solving a local problem using a community um, foundation to do that. And then finally, joint ventures. And this is kind of a category that can include a lot of different things. Um, but really it focuses on partnerships between, for example, charities, local businesses, corporates, local and national governments, where the coming together of two parties allows them to do something that neither could do on their own. And so it might be um, two large organisations that create a third organisation that's the social enterprise that's able to do things that either of those partners couldn't do. And the example here is um, Grameen and Danon. So Grameen Bank, the large microfinance lender based in Bangladesh, and Danon, the French yogurt maker, they came together. Um, Grameen wanted to solve a problem um, in Bangladesh, which was um, uh, sort of health and nutrition for uh, people living in poor villages in Bangladesh and uh, they partnered with Danone to create a high energy, high nutrition yogurt drink um, and Danone partnered with them on the basis that it was a not for loss, they weren't going to make any money but they didn't want to lose any money and then Danone, uh, sorry, Grameen had the networks into all of the local communities from their microfinance operations, which allowed them to have distribution um, and get the, the um, yogurt to where it was needed. So a good example of, sort of two organizations coming together that, that couldn't have done either have done that on their own. So why is it useful to, to have this um, taxonomy of, of types of social enterprise from starting point? Um, each starting point has separate strengths and risks. And it's really crucial to understand what these are um, in order to understand what help is needed. Um, and for examples of this are things like transitioning not-for-profits, governance is really, really important because they're often organizations that are, that are old, are somewhat institutionalized sometimes, and not having governance on board and good process around how to support social enterprise can really be a hindrance to, to making that happen. Um, you know, likewise, if it's a, a social startup and they don't perhaps have expertise in the impact area, then that can be a real hindrance to, to the organization actually being successful. Maybe they, they end up creating an enterprise that, that, that does a lot of business but doesn't have a lot of impact because they're missing some of that impact experience. Um, so the starting point really matters in terms of how you can help. Um, and there's a, a whole bunch of emerging best practice for how to work with and support the different kinds of social enterprise. So being able to understand where they come from allows you to, to go and find the best practice approaches for different kinds of social enterprises. And it also allows you to sort of narrow in on some case study examples of organizations that were in a similar situation to the ones that the one that you may be supporting and be able to understand okay the, they were in a similar position these are the things that were issues for them these are the ways they solved those problems so helps you go and look for those case studies to to figure out how to help all right so our second uh, taxonomy types by way of delivering impact um, and this comes courtesy of social traders. They developed this um, taxonomy and, and we use it. Um, they're based in Australia. Uh, and the taxonomy really breaks um, social enterprises down into three categories um, that relate to the way that they deliver impact. Uh, and it breaks those down into firstly employment and training. So creating livelihoods through employment and training. Um, Secondly, social enterprises that provide equitable access to products or services. Um, and then thirdly, social enterprises that are income generators, that generate cash um, 
and resource for to, to be used for social purpose. So examples of these, the employment one is probably the biggest category of social enterprises in the world. Um, and that's um, about providing employment and training that helps people get into um, sustainable livelihoods. So Te Whangai Trust is a social enterprise that we've worked with in the past, based in Thames in the North Island of New Zealand. Um, and they work with individuals who are coming out of the um, prison system and have um, long-term unemployment or barriers to work. And they, on the other side, they have contracts with big organizations like Fonterra and New Zealand Steel to um, plant trees for them. Um, and so they have a nursery and they do tree planting and the employees get um, sort of work readiness, employment training um, and experience to um, sort of build stru uh, structure around employment and, and help them go into long-term employment, transition um, into long-term employment. Uh, Patu Aotearoa is another um, uh, New Zealand-based social enterprise uh, and it's based in the Hawke's Bay and it's a service for impact example. And so Patu is a, um, a mobile gym for Fano, So it's a mobile gym that travels um, to support people who um, are in isolated communities who want to get fit and have physical activity but either can't afford to, to join a, gym, a traditional gym or don't have access, can't travel, um, aren't in a community that's anywhere near um, a, 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 a traditional gym. Um, so they do that in parks and mud eyes and schools um, and the, um, the members pay a small amount as a member um, and then they come along, they all get together. It's, it's sort of fun community-based gym activity and fundamentally it's providing a product or service that just isn't available for that community. And finally, um, the revenue generating uh, type of social enterprise. The example here is Who Gives a Crap, an Australian um, social enterprise that sells subscription toilet paper. And so their, um, their kind of superpower is marketing, so they sell subscription toilet paper and a portion of the profits go to water aid to fund water and sanitation development projects in the developing world. Um, and so it's a very, very simple model. They make money, some of that money gets used to fund the impact activity. Uh, so why are these categories useful? Um, certainly understanding the impact helps you see what will be important to the social enterprise succeeding in their mission. Um, if you are unclear about how the impact gets delivered or the impact is being delivered in, in multiple ways and um, none of those have been properly validated, then it's really hard to understand where, um, where a social enterprise needs support, what they need to learn, how they need to, what they need to do to prove that they can succeed with what they're doing. So really getting tight and understanding these different types of social enterprise you can understand, okay, well, what are the likely things they're gonna to need to prove? What what it, should their next steps be to be able to, um, to, to move their enterprise forward in a way that's gonna be impactful? Um, and like with the first category, it allows you to look for case studies. It allows you to dig up other social enterprises that were similar uh, in terms of how they delivered their impact. And what were the things that really mattered to them? How did those employment and training um, social enterprises, how did they measure the impact? You know, what frameworks did they use? How did they prove it? What kinds of funders paid for the development of that? Um, you know, so it allows you to kind of pull together um, case studies to learn from so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel with your social enterprise. So for next steps, um, I'd recommend visiting fariaki.org, which is Arkina's um, online tools website. Uh, next steps, you can watch the um, Support Tools um, small webinar on uh, stages of social enterprise and starting to understand how we work out now we've understood what type they are, what stage are they at. Um, find some examples in the case study section of Fariaki, so look for social enterprises that relate to or look like the social enterprises that you're working with and advising and see what you can learn there about um, what they did to succeed and what mistakes they made. 
Um, and there's also a webinar um, called Introduction to Starting a Social Enterprise, which will give you some of the fundamentals on um, how to begin in the process of starting a social enterprise, which gives you another window into what the nuts and bolts of, of a social enterprise um, is and how it works. Uh, and that, that'll really prepare you to kind of be able to support social enterprises and understand what they need when they need it and, and how you can best help.